All right, good morning, everyone. So I have a special guest for you guys today. This is episode five now, so I'm surprised I've gotten this far with it. Each time I get better and better though. I wanted to introduce you guys to a very special friend and client of mine. His name's Ken Morris. Ken is the owner of Limitless Strength and Conditioning in Deerfield, right? It's Deerfield. Deerfield, yes. Deerfield. And he has been open for nine years. So big congratulations to him celebrating that this year. It's a big, a big win for you and big mile marker. And then I want to talk about how he came into strength and conditioning, where he is in his life now. And then we'll go into how we met and where we collaborate on a lot of things. So Ken and I met, what, three or four years ago, I'd say? Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's probably been that long already. I think so. I I know, I've had my practice for three. And I I met you guys before then a little bit. So when I tried to open up my business, and I don't even know if you know this whole background. Uh, you know, my boyfriend inspired me to get known down here. I was very known in New York. I had a big knowledge base over there. I had a good niche. I had a lot of good connects. I didn't have that down here in South Florida. So when we moved down here, I was working for, you know, a regular physical therapy company and I was just miserable. You know, the way they, the way they treat, you know, you're, you're bombarded with a million clients and you're just, you're not being, you're not being the PT that you signed up to be. So I did a booth at the Fort Lauderdale Fit Expo. So right at the convention center, this was back in 2017, 2017, I think, because we came down here in 2016. And I was nervous as hell. You know, we had the table, we, we had, I think it was like two days. And I had just gotten my Graston tools and just got certified. And I was like standing behind, I had made this like video to like get played. Uh, Dexter Jackson's booth was like right down for me. And Chris was like, you better get in front and like show people who you are, you know? <laughs> and I was like, all right, I, you know, I can't be nervous anymore. I gotta, you know, I gotta show my face and be proud of who I am and confident with my skill set. So next thing you know, he's so good at talking to people. I have, you know, 60 people down the line and I'm like, you know, working on people quick and showing them things and my line was super long but that line consisted of Cody Merrill now Cody yeah so Cody owns a gym up in Stewart that I go to every uh, every month twice a month on Saturdays and I've been doing that for almost say since 2017 which is crazy I didn't think I would I don't know I really didn't know where I was going to go with this whole thing so I ended up building up an, uh, a network up there as well. So I, I go from Stuart, almost Port St. Lucie down to Miami, which is amazing now when you think about it. But anyway, Cody had a mutual friend with Ken and Cody had referred him to, I think Mikey to me. And then Mikey came to see me and then Matt came to see me. And then it was like a, you know, a cluster of all these athletes that worked out at Ken's gym that became, you know, started coming to me. And Ken was not someone who ever did body work whatsoever. So we'll talk a little bit about that at some point. And next it's thing you know. <laughs> it took me a while to, to, to come to you finally, even after everybody was telling me to go to you. It took me like right. a year. Yeah. And you never got massage done or anything. I like never that. got anything done. I've never went to a physical therapist. Even, even in all my years of, of football and stuff like that, I never got worked on like that. <laughs> So it was a lot of trust for Ken to come into yes. my office and he finally did. And then we built this great, you know, professional relationship together and, and that's how it all started. So I want to let Ken introduce himself. I want Ken to give us his background because so many people that listen, especially to the strength and condition and nutrition stuff that I, you know, whoever I end up having on the podcast, they also are either in the process of getting certified or, you know, they're you know, they're either, you know, trying to go PT route, SNC route, they're not sure where to go. Yeah. So talk to us about how you got interested in strength and conditioning and going to school and what kind of, you know, transpired that whole route going to Florida State and you went to U- UF, UF? UF, UF, sorry. Florida, Florida. Yeah. Um, and then Toledo. So talk to us about how that whole thing transpired for you and how you got inspired to be where you're at today. All right, so basically, quick story. 
I was, I was like, I was like the shy kid in high school. And then my sophomore year, I got approached by some of the guys in the football team. Cause I was, I was a tall guy. I wasn't real big, but they wanted me to, you know, Hey, try out for the football team. Come out. you you know, you, you got the size for it. Come try out. So I, I tried out. I always worked out a little bit doing biceps in my dad's garage and stuff like that. But once I got into high school football, I was blessed with a coach that like it knew a little bit about weight training. So he kind of brought us through. He was our football coach. He was also our strength coach, but he was, he was decent. And the moment I set foot in that weight room, I was, I was hooked my, like for my entire life. So played high school football a little bit, got hurt, tore my hip flexor. And I was like, great. Okay. So this isn't for me. Went on a, a path kind of after high school, kind of trying to find myself. The, the gym was always there. And then I decided, you know, hey, maybe I should make something of this. Like, this is what I enjoy. Let me try to make something of it. So I went to FAU, enrolled in FAU, went through the exercise science program. I played college football. I walked onto the football team there. I ended up leaving the team because I wanted to focus on the exercise science route. So I was taking six classes a semester. And I'm sure my counselor will watch this and she'll know this, but I try to take more than, than six classes a semester. She wouldn't let me because <laughs> I wanted to get done so fast. And when I walked in FAU, I looked at the internship list and I said, what's the best place I can go? And it was between the Dolphins or University of Florida. And they tried to talk to me, oh, you know, those are really hard to get into. And, you know, you're going to have to. You know, only a very few people can. I'm like, all right, don't you gonna challenge me? That we're gonna we're gonna get this. So I ended up busting busting my butt in school, which is not my thing. School has never been my thing, but I wanted that Florida internship, so I I I fought for it. I fought for it, and finally I got in. Got to UF. Started with softball, women's basketball and football and then I just begged all the coaches to let me work with all the other sports too and so I was there probably I'd say 5 a.m to 9 10 o'clock p.m every day almost seven days a week in the, in the busy times but and it was for free by the way <laughs> but yeah. it was worth it it was worth it. you can't you can't replace that no um so then after my internship they asked me to stay on for a while so I stayed with them um, kept learning, and then the Toledo thing came up. I, my, uh, our assistant head director of strength and conditioning was good friends with Coach Wade up in Toledo. Coach Wade needed somebody, so it was a big step up for me, like, you know, professionally. It's a smaller school, but I had more, you know, it was a, it was a bigger, it was like a promotion. So, so my, my, my boss there told me on a Tuesday, hey, do you want to go to University of Toledo to coach? Mind you, I'm a Florida boy. <laughs> and that Saturday, I was, I was living in Toledo already, coaching already. So then, then after Toledo, won the military bowl, great experience. I learned a lot up there. I came home, and my mom's like, I think you should go out on your own and do your own thing. You know, so she, she kind of put it in my head, like, you can do this. So I always, I always appreciate that from her. Um, and I said, okay, you know, I bought one power rack from elite FDS and got rented a warehouse and just started I off. Don't. Yep. Now we have six racks, nine years later, six racks, the whole, the whole facility, you know, it, it's great. It's amazing. So what, what was like the process of gaining clientele since, I mean, you had a network down here, but how did you get people into like what did you focus more on like powerlifting or you didn't even touch powerlifting at that point? Okay, so I, I started off as like I was like, I'm gonna be a hardcore gym. You know what I mean? Like we're gonna work hard. And like I had this idea, like powerlifting was always my thing, you know, even before the gym. And I was like, Oh, this is gonna be great, you know, like I'm gonna have a bunch of powerlifters, you know, like, we're gonna have powerlifters and I'm gonna train athletes and this and that. And it doesn't always work the way you want it to. Yes. <laughs> you know, you learn real quick that powerlifting is very niche. And it's hard to just have a gym for powerlifting. So funny, funny story is, like, I had a group of teachers that started. 
they 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 taught at a school and I had like 10 of them and they referred people they loved it then those people referred people and, and I've grown so much off word of mouth alone that I mean I haven't even really needed to market fully yet nine years into it you know I do the Instagram thing social media but that that's how I've grown just it's been big word of mouth yeah I I know that a lot because I don't you know people ask me all the time like how did you you know how did you grow yourself so fast like what marketing did you do I was like I, I really it was the work and the person that I was or the person that I am yep and that just you know that I mean that brought me to you too so I always tell people and when I get students I'm like listen if you're yourself and you're good at your craft you don't even have to be the best of the best yeah. you know you have a solid knowledge base but you are someone who can connect to a person you can understand what they're going through you can you know tweak you know you're not so static with each person yep yep it, it, it just speaks volumes you know but that's, that's the job too though that's i mean I, I think that goes understated too much is that you know you could have a billion degrees and and have the best you know you can have all the, all, the, all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't connect to somebody and read somebody and break down, you know, how they respond to things, then, then you're not doing your job. Like, that's our job is to connect to people, you know, like with you, you're like, you know, like I come to you and I complain all the time. <laughs> I just complain, but <laughs> like, you, you know, you know what's going on. Like you, you understand me. So like, you know, what's, what's really bothering me what's not because you understand me and my body, you know, and, and I'm not the same as, as, as somebody else, you know, like you just got to read each person separately. And I think that's a big part of the job that goes un, un you know, understated. And, and I, I truly think it comes from experience too. You know, I always tell my students too, I'm like, look, you just go into one clinic and only seeing a few, you know, staff members for a few hours. Sure, you get to see maybe how they evaluate, maybe you see how they assess clients, and you know, maybe that ties into the education that you had on it. But where I grew my experience, I think, is because I mean, people ask me all the time, how long have you been doing this for? I, I got it yesterday. You know, I had a new client, yeah, yeah. older. Uh, mm -hmm. she's got a slew of different problems from not even just the physical but the mental aspect. And, you know, she's like, I swear. You know, when I told her I was 30 years old, she's like, I swear you are, she's like, you're beautiful and you're young. She's like, but your mentality is so far advanced. She's like, yeah. the knowledge that you have, the way you, you know, you've calmed me down just in the session. She's like, I pay a, a therapist each week and I can't even have someone calm me down the way you just did in 30 minutes. And it's like, it, it's, it's more important when I tell the people that reach out to me, like starting in PT, look, if you want to go into it for the money, you're in it for the wrong, wrong reason, reason because that. you need to remember that it's a person that's in front of you, yep. you know, and that person, their story that comes home with you at night. And I've talked to you about it before with mutual clients, you know, it, it causes you to either not sleep, causes you to wake up with anxiety because you're like, did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? You know? And, you know, I think going into some of the wrong settings taught me even more, you know, oh. work, working, <laughs> working with people that deal with addiction. Uh, when I came down here, that was something that I never thought I would ever be doing, but that just happened to be where my life took me at that time. And I swear it was the best learning experience I ever had because it really taught me how to deal with even the population that appears to be normal, but really have so many other psychological problems going on. And that ties so heavily into people who have chronic pain. And, you know, I mean, we can get going on that in a little bit, but someone who comes in to see me who's dealt with chronic pain, as you know, even if you've had a client that's come in, it's not just that you've had back pain for 10 years. It's, it's the psychological factor. It's, when what it's done at home for them has it ruined their home life you know what love do they still receive yeah, i mean it goes and speaks yeah. volume so 
you know, when we, when we talk about that and how much experience you said, you know, working from 5 a.m. to, you know, 10 o'clock at night for free. I remember those days, you know, I remember those days, but I'm grateful for them because yeah. you got to get your feet dirty in this. Money can't buy that. Mm -mm. But to like with the, the addiction thing too, is like, you know, like powerlifting and, and, and just the gym in general, I think like when you, you know, we're very tight knit, you know, we're like limitless is super tight knit, very small. And like, everybody knows everybody. So it's a, it's a nice community we have there. And I like, you don't realize what you do for people until somebody comes up and hugs you and says, you've saved my life. Like, and it's that it's, it's an interesting feeling. Cause you're like, what do you mean? I, you know, I just, I'm teaching you to, to train right, you know, but you don't realize what you, sometimes you and I don't realize how much we mean to people like that, you know, it's, but it, it's really eye opening. And that goes back to like the money thing. Like you can't get in this for the money. Like, like you can do well, but if you focus on that, you're not going to go anywhere. You have to care about people. People are, are number one. People build your business. That's been on my board for, for nine years since the day I opened my doors. You, you don't build a business, people build a business. 100%. That's actually a really good quote. I like that. It's, Love that it's, quote. It's, it's true because, you know, there's been opportunities that have come across my path where, you know, I could have built up more. I could have, yep. you know, built out, branched out, done all this stuff. But what I could see in the future with that, even just tasting it a little bit, was my mission would have been lost yep, yep. and my biggest I mean if I go back to what was my entry level essay to get into school I would have gone so far away from that yep and that's why when people are like oh man you know you work so late or yep. you know you 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 work so many crazy hours yeah because I like it I yep. love what I do exactly. it's not work <laughs> I, it, it's not. It's something that I enjoy doing on a day to day basis. It's what I eat, sleep, and drink all day. Yep. You know, so, you know, obviously finding balance in life is something like, we're all trying to work on uh, being, yeah. you know, yeah. entrepreneurs. But at the end of the day, like you said, when someone comes up to you and, you know, thanks you for saving their life, you can't buy that. Yeah, you can't buy that anywhere. I thought that, that, that's more payment than anybody could ever give me. 100%. 100%. All right. So let's go into a couple questions I got here for you. Uh, a lot of these questions came from students, I think, or people that are either going the SNC route or, or like SNC with physical therapy. So one of the questions they had for you was when you're starting off a business in SNC, how do you manage your time? You know, how do you, how do you manage, do you do groups? Do you do individuals? Like how, how does that separate? And then how do you make your day so successful that you can tailor each thing towards each person? Okay. So I started off, you have to, first you have to figure out what kind of place, you know, what, what you want to do exactly. Because, you know, I had this vision starting, I was like, oh, I'll just do groups. But then as I started progressing towards the groups and started getting like, like, you know, 10, 12 people in a group, I learned that like, you know, not everybody's an athlete, like in college, so when you, when I was coaching in college. So I learned, I, I, I saw real quick that I couldn't coach people the way I wanted to, because I opened my business to coach people. I didn't want to just throw a work up, work out on the board and be like, all right, here's what we're doing today, guys. Rah, rah, rah. Let's go. You know, like I wanted to coach people. I wanted to get in the trenches and be like, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. So I transitioned from those bigger groups to smaller groups. So now I do maybe, you know, four people at a time, you know, maybe six. Depend it depends on the group, obviously. Right. You know, it's athletes, it's one thing. If it's people that need more attention, that people that are new to training, then I you know I keep it smaller. Um and I've gone more towards, you know, the personal training in the past couple of years because I just, there's just a connection you build with somebody when it's just one-on-one -on -one and like, you can really like get in there and they've never trained. A lot of people are afraid to put a barbell on their back, you know, and if you can show them that, you, 
I don't think people understand how empowering that is to somebody, you know, especially like a woman who's had back pain, who, you know, is, is having trouble going up and down the stairs. And then a month later, she's squatting with a barbell on her back safely. And she's like, I feel completely different, you know? So like, you have to judge, you have to just, you have to figure out where you want to go with it, who you want to train, how you want to do it. And I mean, if you do the right things, learning what you should be learning as a coach, then, I mean, it, it should come naturally. I mean, you'll just, you'll just know when you start training people. Yeah. I, I always tell people too, I'm like, look, just start with the basics, start with the fundamentals. Yeah. You know, there's so much out there now with the internet and whatnot that, you know, people really, really overcomplicate a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. When, you know, you have a client that, you know, when you go and do a squat assessment, you're like, oh boy, you yeah. know, I, and you're, you're squatting with how much weight on your back and it looks like yeah, that, yeah. you know, and, you know, you're, you're trying to say, okay, listen, you did great. However, there are so many things you need to be able to fix before you really get under that bar and start loading that. Yep. So the assessment is everything, you know, looking at someone and assessing their form, you know, some of the, some of these trainers, like just regular personal trainers, not all of them, but they get stuck in a setting like uh, LA fitness or something like that. And they're rushed for time, right? They get a half hour with a client. Well, yeah. how much, how, how much honestly can you get done? Yeah. You can't. It's just not possible. Yep. And I see it a lot of, you know, a lot of times where, you know, the population of people that just go to gyms like that, they don't, you know, they're not educated enough that, that they'll get a trainer. They trust the gym. They trust that the trainers are good. Yep. Uh, you know, and they, they're starting off on, you know, 500 pound leg press, but, you know, they don't even know how to get up from the toilet seat. While, while the trainer's on their phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... I think that's why I like doing a lot of the stuff like the podcasts and, and videos to, to remind people who are just starting out in this industry, it's okay if you don't know the high level stuff just yet, because you really yes. can make a difference with just knowing the fundamentals and the basics. And if you can start there, you can build yourself up from that. Stop well, trying to compare someone's 20 years in business to, to your first five months, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I learned that myself. I got so hard on myself the first time, you know, came out of school, you know, and I'm like, man, I want to be like this guy. And I yep. want to, you know, do, Christiana, hold the brakes. You know, you need to remember that you have to start small and just being so minuscule and the, like the kiss, of the, the kiss, I can't think of the word right now. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean? Keep it stupid yeah. simple, right? Make it make it so simple for that client because they're going to understand a lot of clients can't take a seven step uh you know equation or process to getting to a movement anyway so when you overload someone with that much information they're like what i gotta keep my chest up my brace in my hips back my feet grounded they're like so start start simple yep. so i'll guide this into another question for you when you have someone that comes in whether they're an athlete or they're a non-athlete, what is the number one thing you always want to check for? Like, what's what's your go-to? Well, I, I think I, I've always prided myself on like, if someone I can just have somebody do a squat without a bar on their back and just yep. look at them and be like, okay, that answers everything. You know, because the the biggest thing I see is, you know, like I'm gonna say this and I'll explain it, but the biggest thing I see is lack of core strength like abs, back, but it's not what people think, you know, oh, I just need to do sit-ups. The problem is, is you can do all the sit-ups in the world, but if you're not bracing properly when you train, you're not building that, that deep core strength. So I've trained people, I've trained high-level athletes that I've just went over bracing drills and they're exhausted afterwards. Like I'm going to, like high-level people, they're like, what is going on? <laughs> so like that like i always teach how to use the, the the diaphragm the abs how to brace properly so like 
I mean, that's what I look for first, you know, and then I have somebody do a squat with no bar on their back. Just, all right, do a bodyweight squat. Let me see what's going on. Real easy to see. Okay, hamstrings, quads, you know, ankle mobility, you know, what's going on here. It, it, it's, it's just, it just came from years and years of, of, of just I'm looking scared. at people to know what's going on. But that as a coach, that's what you should be doing. It, it shouldn't take – you shouldn't have to do all these assessments for hours and hours and hours to see, you know, that somebody has tight hamstrings. Like, it's not yeah. hard. Right. And that obviously goes down to, again, experience. I mean, it was the same for me. You know, we learn all this information. They dive into your head, do special tests and stuff like that. Yep. And, you know, it took me even until now. Like, I'm, I'm even getting better at my evaluation now because – I can really tell even from someone walking in the room already what I'm going to find. Yep. And, but that's why I say start from simplicity. And then, you know, as you gain experience and you work more with the population, you'll start seeing that. But it's crazy when you talk about, you know, we, we want to promote in big words, proximal stability for distal mobility, right? I mean, that's sim- as simple as can be. Can they, can they brace that core? Can they stabilize? All right, now look at what's going on, you know, yep. else on yep. the body. Uh, when you say pro athletes too, I, I see it all the time, even at the NFL level, you know. Um, you know, people think doing a million crunches is the answer for a core stability, and it's not. Nope. It's not even it, – even swimmers, I've had some high-level swimmers, and I can see, yeah, they got a six-pack, right, because that's all they use. Yep. They don't know how to use their internal obliques and that transverse abdominis. Yep. They don't know how to stabilize that core. So when you break it down to what is the core, I always go to those four muscles. I go to your multifidus, your transverse abdominis, your pelvic floor, and what else? Your diaphragm. Yep. And if, you, if you have that diaphragm, pelvic floor, transverse abdominis, multifidus, if you have all those four, you're good. Yep. And, that, and that, that was, I think, one of the first courses I took right when I graduated was Stu McGill. Yeah, yeah. Because he really, I mean, he breaks it down to simplicity in the coaching and physical therapy, route, you know, world, what, you know, core stability should mean. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say this about the simplicity thing, too. Like, I feel like if, if you do your research and you, and, you, and you know what you're talking about and you know what you're doing, then you, like, you understand that the simple stuff is what you need to focus on anything. You and I have been doing this forever now, and like the basics always stay the same. Yep. No, you changed. can't replace the basics. You know, and I like I, when I went. I went to a conference, a, a coaching conference in Tennessee, and we went to the the Titans facility, Tennessee Titans facility. Okay. And he's been the the head strength coach there has been doing this longer than I than you and I have been alive. And the first thing he said was, "We stick to the fundamentals." He goes. Yes, things change, you know, like there's always new stuff. There's always, you know, and this stuff could be great. But you don't take out or replace the fundamentals and the simple stuff to, to put this new fancy stuff in. You, you keep your basic, you, your basics, you keep your foundation, and then you, you, you pick and choose what you want to put on top of that. And, it, and you know, not everything's going to work, but you still have your foundation, which is going to make people better. Right. Yeah, I think that one of the things I see wrong, again, going back to the, the industry, is that it's just overcomplicated. So, yep. you know, sometimes I have people that come in, you know, they're dealing with a great deal of pain and they're either pushing through things or they're not pushing through things. But I always have to break it down to those basic principles. And I'm like, look, if you cannot do that, what makes you think you can go and do that and it's going to work well? Yep. And yep. And that's, and my, I mean, my belief, I'm not sure if this one's yours, but my thing is if you can't do something unilaterally, what makes you have the right to do it bilaterally? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I, if I see a Peterson step, which is for my viewers that don't know what that is, it's, you know, you have one leg on a step and you drop down, you look at the hip and the knee, go on the other side, assess the same. If, if you're seeing like this imbalance, what, I mean, it's going to come out when you put the bar on your back. Yep. So I always, I always tell my clients that if, if you can't do it unilaterally, 
what makes you have the right to do it bilaterally? Because as soon as you do it bilaterally, those compensations are going to come out and then load on top of it, we're going to start having problems. Yeah. So even at the professional level, I see it, you know, because these guys are, I mean, even for instance, NFL, right? These guys are doing Olympic lifts, which is what it is. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. not my, what I would go to, but you know, they're doing Olympic lifts, but yet again, if I took them, put a PVC pipe on their back and had them squat, oh, it's garbage. Yep, so I'm like, and now you're Olympic lifting on that? And then yep. you want to know why your ACL is blown out because you just made a turn on the field? Yep, yep. It's, it's, it's crazy, but that's why I think that the world is just overcomplicating a lot of it. And that's yep. why we're seeing a lot of these non-contact injuries come out now because of that. I think I think it's because, and I hate to say this, but I'm gonna say it. I think it's because people need something to sell, because uh, the basics are boring. You right. know, like like the problem is, is is the ego. You know, like oh look at this look at this awesome exercise I'm having this guy do, and look how great he's doing it. He's do you know look how much he's doing a power clean with. And it's like okay, but like if he can't do the basic stuff, that none of that matters. Like, and I think you're right with all the, like, injuries now, you know, like, the Achilles and the ACLs and, like, mo- a lot of these guys came and do a squat, came and do a bodyweight squat properly. They, uh, like, when, when somebody comes to me and said, I got hurt squatting, I'm like, I'm like, show me a squat. And before they even do it, I know what it's, what it's going to look like. Right. It's just going to be, they're going to be, look like a wet noodle. Yep. You know what I'm saying? No bracing, no nothing. So it's, I, I think this overcomplication has come from, let, let me one up this for, oh, look at this person, what they're doing. Let's, let's make it even more complicated. Instead of just teaching the basics, it's not, it's not that hard. No. <laughs> it really is not. Because, you know, I, I go back to like, look at, look at, for instance, football. Look at the, what the injuries were in football, you know, 30 years ago. Joe Namath times, like go back that far, yeah. you know. If they they didn't have as much of the protection that the guys have on them now. But I mean, these rate of non-contact injuries coming yep. out is insane. I can understand someone blast through your leg, you know, blast through your shoulder, you yep. roll over five people, you land on your AC joint. Like I can understand that, you know, but you just, <laughs> you know, here and then turn. Yep, took a boom, step. There's your ACL. I mean, you're almost like, an old lady because you should just get yep. back over and pick up something and that's it. You tore out your whole knee. So well, do, you, do you think it's like, I'm going to ask this question to you because like, I'm, I'm generally curious if your thought on this is like, do you think some of these injuries are because we're not loading the athletes enough? We're not loading those joints and those bones to create that, you know, that, that tendon strength and bone density, because you only get that from, lifting heavy weights and loading the joint you know what i mean like so like you know i see a lot of like these with this functional training and everything else which is fine but if you're not doing the basic lifts in the fundamental lifts you're not loading those joints you're not loading the spine so like i always wondered if that was like you know if that's contributing to it at all i would i would say yes and you know maybe some people would disagree with me in the physical therapy world but I always break it down to what what is sight and show, right? You know, for instance, I I just sat on board for a client of mine who was in a nasty car accident, and she had to have a lumbar fusion, unfortunately. And you know, with with cases, you know, personal injury cases and stuff, they take years sometimes. But you know, she's been fine for two, three years, and I've been trying to get her into the gym with a trainer that I trust. Um, but the lawyer kept saying, no, 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 no. And I'm like, okay, but she needs to get into the gym. Like she needs to start strength training. And they're like, well, you're going to have to show us proof because they believe that if she's able to train in the gym, that she should, she's fine. And, you know, the amount of money she should receive from this, you know, payout should be less because she's fine. If, if she, if you're saying that she can train in the gym, and I came with all these papers from the journals and I said, here you go. Look at what a spine is when it doesn't weight train and look at the spine when it does. 
you increase, I mean, it's physics, right? It's Wolf's Law, it's Dave's Law. You increase the bone density by lifting, right? Which increases the muscle strength, which yep. if muscles are strong, the tendons are strong, and tendons love tension. Yep. Now the passive ligaments, we could only do so much on, but if you're, if you're still putting a load on that body, you're making everything strong. Very so good. when people come in to me just with simple tendonitis, what am I doing? I'm loading it. Yep. I'm loading it in different, you know, either eccentric, isometric, different phases yep. at different times in the healing phase, but I'm loading it. Yep. And I think that more knowledge needs to be brought to the mainstream surface that it's so important that that needs to come out. So when I see, you know, some of these athletes in the pro world, you know, kneeling on a physio ball and, you know, doing hand-eye coordination stuff, which is fine. Okay? fine. Hand-eye yeah. coordination is fine. But then you want to know why they have these blowout ACL, MCL meniscus, it, you know, on the field is because you are not loading yeah, that, those, that's those structures. That's not your. That's not your foundation. That's your. You do that on top of the main stuff. That's the right. problem. Is people gotten so far away? They've gotten so enamored by this stuff. Like, and it's all fine. Like, all that stuff is fine. You want you know you want to do hand eye co coordination stuff. You want to do functional stuff. You want to do you know balance and all this stuff. Like. The way I see it is none of that matters if you're not doing the basic stuff. It's like building a house on sand. If you're not building a foundation, the house is going to crumble. Right. It's, uh, there's another quote. I forgot who said this, but you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link. So, <laughs> yep. so if you don't have that strong foundation, that's it. Yep. That's like, it. Like, like I, I, and, absolute strength is, is, is going to be the, the basis of all your movement. Right. So if you're not strong enough, like you're not going to be able to do all these fancy movements like efficiently. The, if you get stronger and practice all this stuff, then you're going to be well-rounded. And like that, that's when you start getting really good. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. And it, it goes down to even like more about physics, like mass uh, force equals mass times acceleration, right? Yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> so you want to be strong. You want to be fast. You want to be agile. <laughs> I mean, break it down to physics right there. You yep. need to have the loading, con you know, concept into your equation at some point. Yep. And both but, sides of the equation need to be need to be focused on. You can't just do lightweight and explosive stuff all the time. It has right. to. You have to go with the heavier side of things. And you know, everybody's like, oh. Well, you, you shouldn't train athletes super heavy. They don't need to. They don't need to lift super heavy weights. Why not? Why, why are we gonna Why are we gonna hinder them because we're afraid of heavy weights? Why not teach them properly so they can do it right? And then, you know, lo and behold, look at how much stronger they're getting. Look at how they're doing on the field. Well, I see and, it every day. I'm <laughs> oh, hundred percent. I mean, the the problem there is too. So many people want to blame the S and C coach. Oh, that's it's that's the easy Which, part. <laughs> which, which again is relative to the what's going on. Obviously, right? If you have a, if a if you have a bad coach who's not doing those principles, okay. But when you look down at it, you have to look at well, are, what what's going on? Like the SNC coach is just one part of it. If I'm not fixing them, because you have five other coaches saying, well, they got to do this, yep. that, this, that, and the third. Well, why don't you look at the fact that that athlete had to sit in class all day for eight hours, and now all of a sudden you want him to be explosive and you want him to throw ninety-four miles an hour on the field yep. and expect you know his his shoulder to hold up? And it's just it's, <laughs> yep. you know you got the same thing with my general population clients, right? Oh, well, look, I'll never go back to deadlifting because deadlifting hurt my back. And I sit there with my hand like here. It's always a deadlift, yeah. Right, it's and it's like, why don't why don't we look at the fact that you have sat at your desk for twelve hours today and you did it warm up, and then you expected to put four hundred pounds on the bar and lift? Yeah, well, that's and that's where the heavy weight. That's where all oh, heavy weights dangerous comes in. Right. right. It's been like either people are just you know ego lifting, or they have a coach that's just like, yeah, let's lo let's load all this weight on there. Yeah. Oh, this right. is cool. This is great. Like, 
I, like I have some, I mean, you, you know, I have some like 16, 17 year old athletes that are, are lifting more than most people ever lift in their lives. And none of them have been hurt doing it. Nope. Nope. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> 600 and, pound deadlifts at, at 17 years old. <laughs> you know, the amazing thing with that is, I mean, you can talk about this. Let's talk about your baseball kids for a second. You know, I've seen them. I've seen a couple of them grow over the past couple of years that you've been with them. And I mean, realistically, all they come in for now is just maintenance work. You know, they're not coming in with the crazy problems they were having before that you had started with them. But the parents too, you know, oh, yeah. are one of the, I don't want to say a part of like the bigger part of things, but I find myself having to talk to the parents big time and, and break it down for them and say, you know, especially down here, I, I, I don't know, Florida, maybe it's just the times that we're in now, but when I was growing up, baseball was one season. Yep. Football was one season. It wasn't all year round. How do you expect your kid, right? How do you expect your kid to play baseball all year round? He's a pitcher. He throws over 90 miles an hour and you think your shoulder is going to hold up. Yep. Do, 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 do pros play all year round? College doesn't do it either. No. So I, I have to remember to watch what I say, but be an advocate for the athlete to say, Hey, you know, you doing all this stuff for your kid is amazing. It's great. However, you need to give him the time where he has that off season to build and protect his joints and protect his body so that it does hold up for him in season. And it's the same thing with, you know, fighters, boxers, you're in camp, you're in camp, you're out of camp, you are out of camp. Yep. 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 You know what I mean? So I think one of the biggest things that I'm seeing down here, and again, I don't know if it's just here or it's uh, because the weather's nice all year round, or it's just the way the world's changing this, you know, academics, but for them to be playing all year round, it's not healthy. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like from the PT standpoint, it's not healthy. It's not, it's not healthy at all. No, I think, and I think, I, I think they just, you know, I, I get it because it's like, oh, if we play more, my kid's going to get even better, you know, yeah. but it's not always the case because you're going to get overuse injuries and, you know, these kids are going to like fall apart. But I'll say this about that is there's a reason that college and pros have an off season strength program. That's all they do. That's all we'll do for, for what, three months. It's just lift conditioning and lift. They don't touch their sport. And there's a reason for that. We yep. we're that's, that's, that's where my job comes in is let's build this athlete, make them stronger and protect them so when they go back and play, they're even better and they don't have to worry about injury. Oh, 100%. So, I mean, you know, you, you have to get everyone on board, right? Yeah. You have to get – and that's another thing when we talk about egos is that people have to remember it's the person in front of you that matters, right? You know, the PT, the strength and conditioning coach, uh, coaches. I see it all the time. I'm working with a swimmer right now. And the trainer at the school is, I don't know, 18 years old. I mean, he might have just left, you know, high school himself. Yeah. And he has this girl going to swim seven days a week. Seven. Two of those days are two days. And you want to know why her back hurts. You want to know why her hips hurt. And she's not recovering. Yep. Yep. Can't do it. I'm sorry, but you you want to swim in college, your body's not going to be there for you. Yep. And the hardest thing I had to do as a PT is I had to call the athlete because when the parents told the athlete that it's the parents' fault, and then there's a breakdown. And then I got to call the coach to say, hey, man, I'm not discrediting what you do, but you're, you're, hurting, the, you're hurting these kids. Yep. Yep. And I'm, I'm not trying to be the, the bad person here. But at the same time, I got I to remember to tell these guys, like, hey, you can't work these kids into the ground. Yep. You know, their bodies are still rolling. They're still changing. Yep. You know, this girl just 
got her menstrual cycle two years ago. You can't do that because they are going to be the ones that struggle later on in life. Yeah. And, and that's where we say, like, when you break, bring it down to simplicity and you're talking about kids, you have to know what you're doing. You have, you have to. Bottom okay. line. And I'm going to tell you right now, like with the kids, especially like they're going to, they're the, from my experience, like kids are, are going to either, they're either going to be one really lazy or two really gung ho to go like, let's do this. And you have to find that balance to like, like let's work hard, but we got to be smart about it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, these kids are like, Oh, I want to, I want to lift all this weight. I want to do all this crazy stuff. But like we can get there. Yes. But like you have to rein it in, you know, you can't get caught up in that, like, yeah, let's go. I love that. This is great. And you know, like you got to like rein it in a little bit, but going on your, what you were just saying, it's like, I feel like half of our job is like, is, is like trying to like show people like, Hey, like we're not trying to like, we're not trying to promote ourselves by telling you like, Hey, this is what you're doing is going to hurt you. It's not us selling you on something like you and I, like, like we've studied this. This is what we do. And like, when people come to us, we're like, Hey, maybe that's not the best idea. You know? So like, we have to like talk to people about this kind of stuff. I know with parents, especially like parents are like, Oh, weight training is going to hurt them. I don't want them lifting all this weight. I don't want them doing all that. I'm like, this is like, it's great for them, especially at the high school level and middle school too. Like them getting into strength training is huge for them. Like, cause most kids can't support their own weight. <laughs> and you know, most kids nowadays, they're unfortunately not like when you and I grew up where we're outside all day playing around, running around and climbing trees and stuff. Most of these kids are sitting down and yep. at computers or especially with this whole COVID stuff. Um, you know, and you want to talk about what's really going to hurt these kids. It's, it's that stuff. It's the sedentary stuff that they're doing. And yep. You know, unfortunately, times have changed, but I mean, look, if you can take your kid and get him into, whether it's strength and conditioning, ballet, dance, whatever it is, if that kid is moving, they're already set up for more success than the kids that aren't. And I see it all the time. You know, I see kids that are stuck at home or the parents fear taking them out of the home right now because of COVID and getting them back integrated into sports or, or something. Well, why do I have a young kid coming in that's dealing with pain. Really? Yeah. 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 I don't remember. I mean, I remember fracturing my wrist because I climbed a tree, but you know, <laughs> I, uh, I don't remember being a kid where I, I chronically had to tell my mom, like I need a massage or I need to get my back adjusted at, at 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Yep. Come on, you know? And, and that's where like, if we do more stuff like this where we can get out on a platform and we could talk about this and it's more access to parents it's more access to you know the the general population and then that, that's us doing our part which is you know trying to save lives every day trying to make it a better world for these kids but they need the access of information and unfortunately the the information that's really out there is the more popular stuff which is the the cool stuff the you know the crazy looking stuff you know, if I post a general exercise on my Instagram page, I'll get 30 likes. Yep. But if I were to post a picture of my selfie, you know, with lipstick on, that's going to get a thousand something likes. You know what I mean? So, so Chloe, it's like, Chloe's gonna get the most Chloe, Chloe actually gets more on Instagram. <laughs> you know, right about that. She, she gets the most comments. Uh, <laughs> it's true. But that's, you know, because it doesn't look fancy. It doesn't look yep. nice. Yep. But unfortunately the dirt work is the important work. And I have to say that to every client that comes in with an initial injury, it's not gonna be overnight. It's gonna take a lot of time and you're gonna be really annoyed with it. You're gonna be annoyed with me, yep. but guess what? I will get you better. You have to be patient. Yep. It's well, not you know, it's overnight. Funny, it's funny you say that because like, you know, I've, I've experienced in, in my world too, like where people are like, you know, like, oh, it's, it's very, it's, it's like, we do like the same things every week. Sure. I'm like, yeah, because we got to get better at those things. Like the fundamental stuff will always stay the same. Like you're going to get better at this. This is what's going to make you better. 
you know, just because you saw this on Instagram doesn't mean that's what you should be doing. You know what I mean? Like, and I have the same, I have the same problem. Like, like when I'm filming videos, I'm like, oh, it's just, here's, I can film this squat we're doing again, or this deadlift, or, you know, like, it's not fancy to look at. Like what I do is not like, it's cool seeing somebody squat a lot of weight, I guess. But like, like I'm not in this to like, let's make a cool Instagram video. Go, go do this single leg jump on this box and do a backflip. <laughs> you know, like the fundamentals are just, it's boring, but that's what works. Because that's what science shows. That's yep. what the studies show. And it hasn't changed. Nope. Physics hasn't changed. So I want to drop into this. As an athlete yourself, what is the number one thing that you struggled with coming up? I mean, you are like ranked nationally fourth in the world, raw power lifter. So what are some of the struggles that you had to overcome to kind of get to where you are now and your status and, you know, what you hope to continue to do in the powerlifting world? Because I think a lot of people too who had asked me questions are more from the powerlifting community around here. And, you know, for you to be nationally ranked fourth as a raw powerlifter, that's impressive as hell. So talk to us a little bit about that. And what struggles you found coming up into this, to this power, powerlifting program? So when I, when I started, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of jumped into it by myself, never had a coach or anything else. Just, I researched a lot of like Westside Barbell, Louis Simmons stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I did Westside for like two years. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, and, and for those that don't know, West Side, you're basically, you're, you're maxing out on, on a different exercise every week, and then you're doing speed work. So basically, I would do like a box squat up to a maximal attempt, and then three days later, I would do like a squat with bands, like 10 sets of three with fast, just explosive. Um so and those are, your, those are your max effort and dynamic effort. Yeah, it's max effort and dynamic effort. Yep. And then you have the repetition method where it's basically bodybuilding type stuff, which is what protects your joints. Right. But when I was younger, I mean, that was great when I was younger because it was like, I get the max out every week. Hell yeah, let, let's go. You know what I mean? Like, and that was good. But as I, as I progressed and got stronger and got older, <laughs> um, I found that lifting heavy all the time is very counterproductive. Like you can't go, Eddie Cohen says it best. You, you only have a certain amount of singles in the tank in your lifetime. So like you can't ego lift all the time. Like, you know, like my squat is like mid sevens. I squat in like 750 ish, but I only touch over 700, maybe twice out of a four month training cycle. You know, and that's leading into my into my meet. You know, most of the time it's in the 500s, sometimes in the 600s. But like, you, you have to be smart with your training. You cannot go heavy all the time. It's it's you, that's a good way to get hurt. And I've never been, been true. I've been powerlifting 13 years. I've never had a real injury. I've tweaked a hamstring. I you know popped a little rib cartilage, but other than that, no no serious injuries, no knee problems. You know. No back problems, really. I don't have back pain. Never been hurt like that. But you just – you got to be smart. And you got to listen to your body, too. You know, it's not always – the program can be on the board or, or in, your, in your phone, you know, this is what I'm doing today. But you have to learn to adjust, too. It's not just – that's not the be-all, end-all. you got to listen to your body, too. That's a big thing. Yeah, a lot of people ask me, too, you know, I did powerlifting first, and then I transitioned into bodybuilding, and then I – I, I kind of now mix the two. Um, yeah. You know, they're like, well, why? I'm like, well, you know, I like the powerlifting aspect for the, my big big lifts and my big moves. Um, but I kind of tie into the, the bodybuilding stuff for my accessory work. And, and that's, that's pretty it, pretty much it. I'm not, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't know if I'd ever compete ever again in anything, but, you know, I find that my stamina throughout the day training like that as a, as a PT, I'm healthy. Um, I function well. I have the strength I need throughout the day. I work on big, big, big people. I work on small people. I have the balance of both. So in my career and where I'm at now, I find that the balance between those two 
is much healthier for my body than if I were to do more like max effort days all the time. Yeah. Although I do love West Side Barbell. Um, I, I do, I do like I, that. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I use it. I use it a lot for athletes coming out of injuries or after surgery, the concept of it. Um, yes. So, you know, especially, you know, tendonitis things and they can't, you know, load as heavy. I do a lot of dynamic effort stuff. So, you know, I, I love it, but I, like I said, if I were to do it on a day-to-day -day basis, I know I wouldn't be able to walk into well, mom, gonna, going, on that, going on that point too is, is so my mentor at Florida, he told me, he always said, you either want to be a power lifter or you want to be a strength coach. And at first I was like, what? Like, I was like, oh, I can do both. But he, that's not how he meant it. It wasn't either or. It's like you have to focus on what you want to focus on. You know, like I love my powerlifting, but th this is important to me is I'm a powerlifter, but that is not what makes me a coach. You know, a lot of people you see on like, oh, look at me lifting. I can coach you because I lift weights. You know, you see that all the time. That does not make you a coach. Mm -mm. Lifting weights does not make you a coach. Anybody can lift weights. My powerlifting does not apply to my coaching. It helped me learn, yes, but people don't come to me because I'm, you know, ranked in the top whatever in the nation. I'm a strength coach first, and powerlifting is just my thing on the side. I love it, but that's my thing. It's not my business. That's, a, that's, that's an important point that I like to make to people. I like that a lot. You know, that transitions into the bodybuilding world as well, which yep. is something I saw explode after Instagram kind of got big because when, uh, when Chris and I had been starting to compete, Instagram was just coming out, you know, bodybuilding was like a, almost like something unheard of, you know what I mean? There was no like YouTube videos on it. There was, it was so taboo, you know, me carrying my gallon of water on was like, you know, through New York City, people are like, what is that girl doing, you know? Um, and then when social media got bigger, not that it's a bad thing, but what I saw was, you know, you, you did one show and now all of a sudden you are teaching people how to prep for their own show, yet you have no knowledge on nutrition, you have no knowledge on supplementation. And now you've got these guys that are just telling them, oh, inject testosterone, uh, without with a Rimadex and now, you know, your athletes got kind of messia and they're dealing with all these other, other problems, and especially the females, right? Some of these coaches telling females to take these steroids, um, even at like bikini level and, 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 oh, yeah. and figure level. And, you well, know, they're, easy. they're, they're messing up their hormones and they're dealing with, you know, I mean, it's uh, it, period it's issues crazy. and stuff. It's crazy. I mean, why, yeah. why, you know, why take the time to, to learn and, and, you know, sacrifice to be a great coach when you can just, you know, do one show. Easy and zero. It drives me crazy. That drives me crazy. It's the same thing. It's the same, you see it everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I, you know, I played football, so I'm a coach now. Like, no, that doesn't work. You know, like, and, and going back to what you just said about like, hey, I did one show. So like, do my, do my diet and do what I did. Like, that doesn't work. Because like everybody's different. That's you could read a text. Everybody's different. Everybody responds differently. Oh. Hold on, I got lost here. Wait. You there, Doc? Yep. I don't know why you I lost you. Hold on. Hmm. How did I lose you? Hold on. Please reconnect. Okay, we're back. I'll just I'll just have to cut this segment out. I don't know what happened. What happened? I don't know. You froze and then my computer went black and now it's back. So it's still recording. I, I, I was still going and then I just you were just frozen on screen. I was like, are you okay? 
I, uh, it's still recorded. I thought I lost it all, but I'll just cut this segment out. Uh, I got you cut off that you said you could read all these textbooks and then I lost you. Oh, okay. Okay. Do you want to like restart that part or? Yeah. Restart. If you can remember what you said. What, what were we talking about? We were talking about how, you know, with bodybuilding or nutrition, it's like you could do one show. Oh, and okay. yeah. No, so like, yeah, you can, you know, you can, you can read a textbook and learn how to do, you know, how to do movements and, and know how to do it yourself. But if you don't have the knowledge to, to break down each and every person, because everybody's different, everybody moves differently. You know, some people's in a lift, some people's feet need to be narrow. Some people's feet need to be wider because the hip joint on everybody is different. So like you have to be able to apply this stuff. What works for you won't always work for somebody else. That's a big thing. And that's a big thing with all the information out there. You know, like we are, we're in an era of like overload of information, you know, and not all their information is great. And some of it's amazing. But yeah. the problem is, is it could be the best cue in the world for you, but that might not work for somebody else. That's, that's what coaching is. That's That's what physical therapists will learn you. You good? Yeah. So my thing is, is that you can have, you can have all the knowledge in the world too, but can you apply it to each person? Yeah. You know, and, 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 and make it make sense. Yep. You know what I mean? So you get, and it's the same in the physical therapy world, like you were saying, you can, be the best physical therapist in class, you could have had a 4.0 and you could have graduated with flying colors. That's great, but how did you apply it practically? Yep. You know what I mean? I did way better, I'll be honest about it. I did way better on my practicals than I did on my written tests. Guess what? I, you know, me memorizing stuff is great. That's okay. Me being able to apply it is even better. Yep. You know, so when people ask me how you study for your boards, I just took practice tests because I just took clinical situations and I took it from that aspect for me to just remember certain things like, you know, the amount of white blood cell count to red blood cell count you need. Okay, great. But like, that's not what the test is going to be about. The test is about how you apply it to a person and the story and the, you know, vignette that they give you. So, yeah, you know, my thing is, you know, everyone's different learners, everyone's different, you know, they process things differently. Like we talk about how you would apply that information when you're teaching a squat to someone who's a kinesthetic learner, someone who is a visual learner, yep. you know, uh, someone who is more verbal, right? Your, your, your cues have to be different. And that's the important part is learning your client. And that's why, you know, when people call me for an appointment, they don't understand that I don't take insurance and I'm one-to-one. I'm like, well, here's the reason why I need to learn you. Yep. I need to know who you are because yep. your back pain is different than the person before you's back pain exactly. and so forth. So you got to treat just like in strength conditioning. You have yep. to learn the athlete. You have to learn the client that you have in front of you because they're all different. I don't have one person I've ever met. That's the same thing as someone else. I agree. Yep. 100%. Everybody's different. Everybody learns differently. And some people you can, you know, some people you can push more. Some people you have to, like, be more gentle with and, like, you know, more, like, reassuring. You know, some people you have to baby through the process. It just That's just the way it is sometimes. And people right. people always change, too. That's the thing is once you get going with them, you're not going to be able to do the same things with them that you were doing a year ago. Right. You know, because they're going to change and you have to adapt to that. That's how you get people better. You know what I mean? If you can't make adjustments on the fly as you progress somebody, then, then like you're not doing your job. It's not always going to be the same. Everything's going to change. It always uh -huh. changes. You know, the, uh, I think one of the things I want to say too, is that, you know, being a coach or being a physical therapist or being in the medical world in general, bottom line at the end of the day, you have to see who's in front of you. And yep. And as personal trainers, even if you're stuck in those settings, you know, at LA Fitness or something like that, you have to learn to educate those clients. I mean, I was one. I had to start at like a 
blink fitness, you know, 30 minutes. And I'm like, Oh God, you know, I don't have any knowledge base or although I thought I had some sort of background knowledge because I graduated, but you know, your, your clients, I don't want to sweat. I want to sweat. I want to work hard. I'm like, yeah. okay, but like, you can't even like sit down onto the, you know, the bench for me. I'm yeah. sorry, but I'm going to break it down. And I remember my manager at the time was like, Oh, you know, you're doing really well, but you know, one of your clients is like, Oh, you're not making them sweat enough. But I'm like, well then take them off my yeah. roster because I'm not going to, you know, she has a hip replacement. She has, you know, I don't know, five or my, whatever. I'm not going to push her to a limit where I over push her. And then my license or my, my certification is taken away from me. Yep. You know, you're not, I'm not even getting paid enough for you to do that. You know, making you know, 50 an trainer, hour. You know the trainer at LA Fitness at one no. point? No. Yep. When I, I was, I think I was like 18 or 19 years old. And my boss used to make me say I was 23. So people wouldn't get scared. But it's funny because I ended up, I was, I was making the most money at anybody in there because I was just like all for it. And I was like, but he, same situation. I would like, I'd be like, oh, let's go do RDLs. You know what I mean? I'll teach you to do RDLs. It's great for you. You know, oh, you know, you want nice legs. Like, let's go do RDLs. And I never forget, I had one client and I got her into like the weight area of, you know, LA Fitness. And my boss is like, what, what are you doing with her? You need to just keep her on machines. She needs, needs to do machines. I'm like, why? You know, I'm like, I'm like, for what? But like, it, it, it's just crazy looking back. Like, like, you know, even then I was like, let's, I want to do this. And I want to get this. And it's, it's like, I've always loved this so much, but it's, it's so weird to see the transition now. <laughs> like, like from LA fitness to where I am now, it's crazy. Oh yeah. I mean, I transitioned like that too. I started at Blink Fitness and then I was at a country club training and, and then I did strength and conditioning and then I, you know, uh, graduated and went the PT route. But at that same time, you know, I think a lot of my bosses trusted me a lot because I was in PT school. So they would give me a lot of the higher problematic clients. Um, but then they'd be like, oh, well, this one says they want to do this. And I'm like, okay, but do you know that like her shoulders replaced? Do you know that yeah. she has a lumbar fusion? Do you know that she has all these other things? So no, I'm not going to go take her to do sprints on the hill outside at so 65 years old. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just so she could sweat. I'm like, no, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, but yeah, it is, it's, it's funny. So that's why I say, you know, I like doing stuff like this with someone like you, because people that are going to watch this that are up and coming or they're starting out and they're starting out young in this industry, you know, it's okay to have to start at that level, but yeah. you're going to appreciate it more as you get to the status that you and I are at, which is just growing in our careers and growing in our businesses, because it took those steps to get to where we are today to learn like no that's not what you want to do yep and this is where you want to go and this is what you want to work up to yeah but it, and if you're up and coming in this if this is what you want to do you know strength conditioning physical therapy like call us and like like hey can i come shadow you for a week can right. i come can i come talk to you can i come I, I think that's a big thing that people have missed and i know I still communicate with my, uh, my, you know, she was my guidance counselor at FAU and she's like, yeah, the biggest problem we have is, is people don't get out there while they're in school. You know, they go to school for this, but then they come out of school and they, they have no knowledge like experience. So like, is, if you're going to do this, like contact people, like don't be afraid to get out there and like come, you know, go, go shadow somebody, go intern somewhere. Like, yeah, you're not, you're basically working for free, I guess, but like, it's, it's going to be the best knowledge and the best money you could ever get. Like that, that knowledge is, is priceless. I did it for a long time. You know, people ask me how I even started. I was cleaning tables at 14 years old in a therapy, you know, small therapy office in my hometown. And I mean, I'm cleaning tables and I'm like, listen it, you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then the I'll doctor's like, I'll clean you up with a toothbrush. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my God, you have no idea. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, and the doctor's like, are you interested in this stuff? I'm like, yeah, that's why I volunteered, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and they pulled me in and I learned from, I learned from some great people. I learned from some not so great people, but that, 
that taught me to be the sponge that I am today, which is like, I, I, I'll do something, right? And I'll still in the back of my head be like, I remember that, that quote from, you know, so-and-so, or I remember those words coming from so-and-so and I can, you know, I am a culmination of all the people that I learned from and then myself included. So I have to thank them because they gave me that time, you know, but I, it took me getting uncomfortable to say, oh, I'm going to spend six hours in my afternoon when I really should be studying and doing this stuff, but I'm going to go clean tables and I'm going to go Yep. You know, be at this person's office because this is my this is my goal in life is to be at that status. So it took me, you know, working six days a week. And then that one day I'm driving 45 minutes to stay at a friend's house to go and turn up this other person's house. You yep. know, eventually it, it led me to getting some money working as an aide in some places. But I mean, most of the stuff I did up until I graduated with my doctor, it was free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my uh when I when I got when I finally got in contact with my guy at uh, UF, when I went there, he's like, oh, we'll do a phone interview. And I'm like, no, I'm driving up. So four hour, four hour drive for a 20 minute interview. And I never forget, he, he, he sat me down at his desk and he had a stack of papers that was like, I mean, it was, a, it was a lot. And he goes, he goes, these are all resumes. What makes you any different? And I, and I, I told him, look, I go, I love this. Like, this is my, this is what I want to do with my life. This isn't just like coming to UF. Like this is, I love it. And he said, I got the position because he could tell how much I loved it and my enthusiasm for it. That, so it's not, it's not how much, you know, all the time it's, it's, you know, are you passionate about it? Do you love it? Do you love what you do? But my, my first couple of weeks, I walked around with a towel in my pocket and a spray bottle hanging out of my other pocket, just cleaning up ever, after everybody. And like you said, like, like, Oh, what was that? What was that about, about this? What is he doing over there with, with baseball? What's he doing over there with this? And like, I had to earn my way. And I mean, it was tough. I, I know there was one day and this is embarrassing, but I'm going to tell it because everybody needs to hear it. I, my boss broke me. Like he was like, go do this, go train this person, weigh this group in, go open the training table. Training table is like, it's like little snacks before workouts that we give the guys. Yeah. But it was like down the hall. And I'm like, this is like, it was literally impossible for me to do all these things. So I'm like, I, I'm terrible at this. I like, I'm this, I suck. Like, I'm going to get fired. Like, you're going to throw me out. And I never forget. So we finished the day and I'm walking out. I got my head down. I'm like, like going to lose it. Like I was going to have a breakdown. And one of the other coaches pulls me aside. He goes, he goes, Ken, he does it because he's testing you to see how you handle this. So then the next day, he, my, my boss walks by me and he goes, he goes, Ken, sometimes it's all about chaos. <laughs> and my boss, now that I see it, it was just, he saw it and he saw something in me. So he wanted to push me and test me. And like, it sucked back then, but like, I, I'll never forget that. And like, I appreciate it so much now because it does get chaotic at times. <laughs> it does. And I, I, I think the bottom line to this whole thing too is like, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to learn from people that have taken those steps to, to be where they're at or where you want to be. And don't be afraid to mess up either. Yep. You know, we've I think so, so many people, right. So many people think it's going to be like this perfect straight line. And it's like, it's not. And even when you get out there and you're in business, it's not. And you and no, I both know that. Um, so uh, all right. I wanted to wrap up with a couple of things. I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. I'm definitely going to get you back on um, this year because I want to talk a little bit more about specifics, but I want to get people to know you and know who you are, your background and stuff like that. We can have some more educational talks as, as the year goes on. But what is a way for people to contact you if they are interested in training or interested in coming into the gym do you prefer like instagram and stuff like that because i'm going to put it all down at the bottom of the youtube link yeah you can you can message me on instagram um you can go to my uh website it's uh limitlesssc.com um and just you can call me if you call me I, i'm not on my phone in the gym so just if you call me you can't get it just leave me a message or just shoot me a text it's my personal phone on there. So just shoot me a text. Um, Instagram's easy. 
pretty much those, those two ways are probably the best way to get a hold of me. Okay. And are you taking interns at all? Yeah, I'm always, I'm always open for interns. I'm always, please, please, like anybody that he listens to this, contact me. Like, I, I, I love teaching. That's my, like, one thing I love doing is teaching. Amazing. All right, so I will put Ken's information down at the bottom of the YouTube link for you guys. And I will also put his contact info there so you guys can grab that. And again, I will have Ken on for you guys so we can talk a little bit more educational stuff. But again, Ken, thank you so much for coming on. Anything else you have to say to everyone? No, just keep going, Can't work hard, be limitless. That's be my limitless. motto. I know, I got my shirt on here. <laughs> yep, be limitless. Be limitless. All right, if, if you guys can like, subscribe, and comment down below. If you guys have any questions for Ken, I'll make sure he gets to them.